So today's lecture, as I mentioned, is on measurement of innovation and methods of innovation. We are uh, in the second half of the uh, course, I'm finishing up a subsection on methods of innovation. We talked about the projects, curiosity, observation, and passion. And in the discussion session, I went through an example from my experience walking around campus and I saw this ant uh, lifting this leaf that was five times its size and uh, working with other ants too. And I thought that was a very fascinating observation. Then we talked about the K-19 nuclear submarine accident. We talked about Korean Air Flight 801 and some of the interesting comments that the students made about uh, this being uh, not speaking up, uh, about uh, authorities covering up. Uh, so on many levels, there were problems with this. And the reason why this is important for innovation is communication, openness, and a willingness to confront difficult situations in order to improve them is a fundamental mindset for innovation. Now, the other reason I mentioned these examples is I'm the remainder of the lecture is about methods of innovation. And during the discussion, we also talked about uh, these methods and I'm going to outline some methods, but ultimately these methods are just, if you will, a uh, little bit of structure to help you or help organizations to innovate. The fundamental method, the one that is very difficult to teach is the mindset of innovation. And if you don't have the mindset or the philosophy and the passion for innovation, these methods don't really matter. Uh, so in your own work and when you lead your companies and you get into positions of influence <clears throat> uh, for you to be able to express and show good example of this mindset is ultimately the best method of innovation. So I mentioned in the book Waves about chapter 29 and the Ergang example when uh, Mr. Ergang says 99% of people will be followers. Uh, and the book is fiction, but that little anecdote is a true story, uh, actually. And um, it's all, all about a mindset. So in our discussion, we talked about what is your preferred method of innovation. Some of you mentioned uh, brainstorming, and um, we talked about thinking outside the box, and, and others mentioned uh, benchmarking. So now let's talk about some of these preferred methods of innovation. Keeping in mind though, Mr. Ergang's words and this concept that ultimately it's about mindset and not about any specific methods. So quickly by way of review, uh, sorry about that. Uh, by way of review, we'll uh, review last week's uh, discussion. We talked about the distinction between basic and applied research and the two dimensions were whether that research is going to be used or whether that research is going to be for a fundamental understanding. And those two dimensions, yes and no, create four categories. And of course, the category of no and no, in other words, it's not useful or it's not being considered for use and it's not interested in fundamental understanding. That is not the research, uh, that box is empty. Uh, but you can fill that box with a word, you could call it a hobby or a pastime, or uh, I think a hobby is, uh, I forget what the Korean word for hobby is, trijik or something like that. But anyway, uh, just a hobby. So it's not really research and uh, uh, we're not gonna consider that. So the other three boxes are pure basic research where you just wanna have fundamental understanding and the considerations of use are not significant. And the uh, exemplar scientist, which I'm sure you're all familiar with is Niels Bohr. And then on the other side is purely applied research where you're just focusing on the use and you're not interested in getting any fundamental understanding. And that would be the example of the inventor, Thomas Edison. Uh, the most promising and most important area, especially uh, as we come into our current time, is use-inspired basic research, where you're both uh, influenced or inspired by applied applications or applied uses, 
and also to get some scientific understanding. We call that use-inspired basic research and Louis Pasteur is a perfect example of that. Uh, the reason why we make this distinction is that in uh, a lot of innovation, you have separated out and split basic research in the universities and applied research in the, in the industries. But the most productive area of innovation is when the basic and the applied come together. So uh, finding ways to do that uh, is the most productive way to do innovation. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do science or the best way to do business. But if we're talking about innovation, it is at the intersection of basic and applied research. It also helps to do good science, as we talked about the example of Einstein uh, at the patent office, uh, where even though he's coming up with very basic science, theoretical physics like relativity and so forth, he's influenced by the patents and the technological and, and engineering challenges of his time. And then we also <clears throat> talked about the fourth industrial revolution with the uh, first, second, and third industrial revolutions being defined largely by uh, individual technologies, the steam engine, electricity, and computers respectively, whereas the fourth industrial revolution is mostly defined by convergence. And so that technology convergence implies we have to bring many different areas together. And of course, that leads directly to innovation. The other concept that we talked about is the a uh, very fundamental uh, central role that innovation plays in creating value. We talked about history and how successful societies, Roman Empire, uh, the Dutch, the, the British, during the British Empire and so forth, uh, <clears throat> were able to create a lot of innovation and that helped them to be successful on the world stage. Uh, but this concept of innovation also relates to just business and economic value. And in fact, innovation is the only true way to create value. And we discussed this in the context of economic uh, theory, supply and demand. And when the supply and the demand meet, that's the equilibrium point. That is what determines the price and quantity of goods. Most of you who have taken basic economics know this uh, concept. Now, the, the impact the next level implication of this is not just the determination of the price and quantity, but in this sort of equilibrium free market uh, economics is implied the concept that these points represent equilibrium. And they, that equilibrium is like the physics concept of equilibrium. Uh, things are not changing. And at these equilibrium, there's many proofs and examples and so forth. The profits are minimal and uh, everything is stabilized. So if you want to make a profit, you wanna create new value apart from an equilibrium, you have to be away from the equilibrium. And the two ways of being away from the equilibrium are artificial, such as rent seeking or uh, <clears throat> natural or intrinsic, which is new ideas, new innovation and so forth. So innovation actually is the only true way to create value. So how do we measure innovation? Well, we have some metrics of it. Uh, well, we're gonna talk about that, but we, in the last lecture, we introduced this with the Booz Allen study, which was a survey. We also talked about megatrends, monopolar and dipolar. And we discussed closed versus open innovation and open innovation being really important uh, in the uh, 21st century with the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera, for innovation because one company cannot do everything. And I discussed uh, when I was at Samsung, how I created a virtual terahertz medicine institute, bringing different projects in together to uh, uh, create a kind of open innovation. So we did projects uh, uh, with Ohio State University in the United States with the MIT in Boston, Cambridge and with the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. And, so now we'll talk uh, about methods of innovation, measurement of innovation and uh, methods of innovation. So <clears throat> how do we measure innovation? Well, we have two dimensions that we can consider the measurement of innovation. One is, are we measuring it in terms of quantitative or qualitative? So that's here. 
as you can see. And then the other one is what exactly are we measuring? Are we measuring the innovation culture? And we've emphasized in this course how culture and mindset are extremely important. So that comes first. Related to the innovation culture is the innovation process. So we can measure the process. And of course, the best way to measure things are usually by the results, uh, although that's not always so easy. Uh, and it's not always just related to innovation, but to the extent that innovation leads to greater value, then we look at the uh, results, like uh, new success stories, return on investment, uh, percent of sales increase and so forth. So in terms of culture, uh, you know, how many people are involved? That would be the quantitative, the percent of people trained uh, would be some ways of measuring that culture. It's very difficult to measure. Uh, on the qualitative side, the participant stories and just uh, uh, the feeling around uh, the company, et cetera, for measuring that uh, cultural aspects of innovation. And then on the terms of process, uh, quantitatively, we can uh, list the number of ideas in development, number of uh, projects, the number of patents, uh, and qualitative uh, number of prototypes and learnings and so forth. And of course, as I mentioned, returns, we can look at the financial returns, we can look at uh, success stories and other learnings qualitatively. So these are all different measures of innovation. Now, if we look at the Booz Allen uh, study, that was a qualitative study. In other words, it was a survey of innovation executives and it was more related to the outcomes or the results, less about the culture and the process and so forth. Uh, and then of course they made connections to financial results in order to see what would be the influence of that innovation on those results. So now let's talk about some uh, methods of innovation. As I said at the outset, these specific methods are to facilitate and help you individually or groups to innovate. But there is no replacement for the fundamental mindset of innovation, which is to have curiosity, observational sensitivity, and a passion for improvement. And that is the purpose of the short projects, as I mentioned. If you don't have those elements, uh, then the improvement in innovation that will occur as a result of these methods is going to be quite minimal. Uh, so we are going to talk about these methods, but they should not be considered a substitute for the actual innovative thinking. Uh, they are in a way a process of improving it. So as we mentioned, innovation is about, uh, for, uh, based on the evolutionary model, it's about uh, communication, transparencies. So the Korean Airlines flight and the Russian submarine K-19, they had problems. They couldn't innovate because people were not communicating the issues. There was no communication. So that's number one. Number two is variability, the evolutionary model of variability. So the ability to have many different ideas. So innovation methods should create many possibilities. So another problem with K-19 and Korean Airlines 801 is that only one person was thinking, that was the boss, or the junior person was not able to get there or did not want to get their opinion shared. So the variability of ideas was small. And so you could not adapt and come up with a solution, innovative solution, new solution to a difficult problem. And then the third one is, of course, testing with reality. Uh, and as one of the students mentioned, uh, actually doing it, just doing it, and action is very important. So just sitting around the table is not always good for innovation. And some of these methods that I'm going to talk about, such as brainstorming, don't have a lot of action associated with them. And that's one of the limitations. Uh, a method of innovation we'll talk about called design thinking uh, does have elements of this action, uh, but we'll talk about that uh, in turn. So those three elements are very important. Communication, transmission of information, variability of ideas, and testing with reality. 
So in the area of brainstorming, it's a method of innovation. We have several sub-methods, mind maps, fishbone diagrams, flowcharts, SWOT analysis, starbursting, affinity diagrams, concepts maps. So let's talk about mind maps. Mind maps are a useful tool to visualize and organize information. Remember we said that a key element of innovation is to come up with a wide variety of ideas. Well, one way to come up with a wide variety of ideas is to take a situation or a problem and map out all the different aspects of that uh, idea. We call that a mind map. So if you try to map out all the different aspects, you can think of innovation around each of those. So for example, consider the concept of a vacation or holiday. Uh, well, you have the transportation aspects, you have the accommodation, uh, sukpak uh, aspects, you have the activities that you may be wanting to be involved with, and you have the people that may be involved, your family, and then the location, uh, geography, and so you make a map of all these things, and you might have an innovative idea how to have a very nice holiday. So you do uh, all you know, activities, you think of different activities and so forth. You think of better modes of transportation. You have a map of all the possibilities and that helps to innovate. So let me call that a mind map. Another framework for innovation is what's called a fishbone diagram. And this is a kind of reverse brainstorming. So in innovation, you usually try to find the solution to a problem. You want to make something better. But in fishbone diagrams, you, instead of finding the solutions to problem, you want to see how you get the opposite effect. So this is bad burgers, hamburger. And so if you want to create the bad burgers, then you have uh, bad materials, bad methods, bad machines, bad environment, bad measurements, bad people, and so forth. And all these possible bad things that can go in to create the bad burger so you can innovate about how you can actually make uh, a good product. And this opens the mind. Remember we talked about thinking outside the box. So everyone wants to have a good effect. Well, let's think outside the box and think about what can cause a bad effect. Uh, so these are called fishbone diagrams. Another form of brainstorming is around flowcharts. And flowcharts are a kind of mind map, but instead of really just mapping out all the concepts uh, or the components, you actually talk about steps in a process that go sequentially. So flowcharts have a time element or a process element. Uh, so let's say you have a lamp that doesn't work. You, you try to see what are all the elements related to the process to uh, fix the problem. So the problem is the lamp doesn't work. Is the lamp plugged in? No, you plug in the lamp. Is the, if it is plugged in, is the love bulb burned out? Yes, replace the bulb. And uh, if it's not burned out, then you have to replace or repair the lamp itself. So that's a simple example of a flow chart relating to sequential process. Another framework to assist in uh, innovation is what's called a SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is a summary tool that lets you summarize the internal aspects of a company and the external aspects. So the strengths and weaknesses, which are the internal aspects, and the opportunities and threats, which are the external aspects. So uh, you list all these parts. So you try to cover the wide landscape of the issues, internal and external, positive and negative. And then you can uncover some issues that can give direction to innovation. Another example of a framework for innovation is starbursting. And starbursting is instead of directly discussing the solutions, you look at the problem by understand, trying to understand all the questions around the problem. And there are six fundamental questions. Who, who is involved in the problem? What is the problem? Where is the problem? And uh, when is the problem occurring? Why is the problem occurring? How is the problem occurring? Uh, these are the six questions, and there may be some overlap between the questions, of course. So uh, I gave a seminar at Next Rise. This was uh, back in uh, October, 
And NextRise was a big startup uh, conference in Seoul, one of the biggest in Korea. And uh, my conference was about, uh, my seminar, my presentation was about going global. And I wanted to think innovatively how to present this concept of going global for Korean startups. Uh, instead of me just saying, oh, you have to be global and, uh, and so forth, I wanted to talk about all the questions. Who, what it means to be global, you know, where are we talking about global, when, uh, now, next year, in the future, why do we go global, how? Uh, and so this star bursting diagram was a way to innovate the presentation uh, and demonstrate some of the core concepts. Affinity diagrams, uh, you can also group ideas, so they're easy to read and analyze. So this is affinity diagram about some sort of uh, uh, product. You know, what is the uh, elements that are related to people, the distribution of the product, the quality of the product, the capacity, and some of the key problems. And one of the key themes in innovation, as you'll see, is to address problems. And that's why I mentioned the cultural aspects. If there's a culture that uh, wants to avoid problems, if there's a culture that says it's not good to talk about something bad, it's not good to uh, make someone feel bad, kibuni napayo, and all this kind of stuff, then that create, makes it very difficult to innovate. Uh, a key aspect of innovation in all of these is, as you can see, what are the problems uh, involved in this situation? So lack of staff training, difficulty recruiting, not enough trucks, insufficient ovens, and so forth. Uh, everybody wants to hear about the good things. Uh, this class is wonderful. You are all the best. And you're the greatest students in Korea. You're the best students at Digist. You know, this is all good stuff. And I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing your professor saying these things. Uh, but as you know, the last class before was not a good class. And I was very disappointed in that. And I think that that's a more important lesson so that we can learn and improve than if I just go and say, you are all the best students that the world has ever seen. Uh, that's not a very... Uh, useful, to be very frank, uh, comment. Uh, again, as we mentioned, this, we don't want to be negative. Innovation is intrinsically about making the world a better place. There's intrinsically a positive mindset to innovation, but it's concentrated on problems and how we can improve them. So concept maps are learning, are learning and teaching technique, but they can also be used for the relationship between ideas and concepts. So concept map is often used if you were learning something. When we were talking about the learning in two lectures ago in neurobiology of learning, <clears throat> we talked about making the, the landscape and how Elon Musk also does this method of making a tree of knowledge and then adding to that tree and connecting new knowledge to that tree. And as I mentioned, that type of learning also can underlie innovation. So here you have a concept map uh, about a course, and then you have learning theory, you have assignments, you have the online tools, uh, and then you have these different categories, but what if you can make lines between them? What about some assignments, thoughts and questions that can relate to constructivism uh, and so forth? So you make these connections and that can lead to innovation. So another method of innovation is related to uh, predicting where technology will go. So Obviously, innovation is about the future. And if you can imagine the future, then you can innovate. It's one reason why we are reading waves. It's a form of science fiction. If we can imagine the future, that helps to innovate. Well, there's not just imagining the future in literature or fiction. It's also established method uh, <clears throat> used in businesses and so forth to uh, predict future technologies, future products. And this method is called TRIZ, and it's based on what's uh, understanding and applying established evolutionary uh, trends in technology development. And some of this is actually quite obvious, uh, and that's why it's very powerful for prediction. We know, for example, that weapons in the military will become more uh, further action. Uh, from a knife,
to a gun, to a missile, it goes longer and longer distance. So we go from short distance to long distance. That's the natural progression. It's likewise, those weapons become more powerful. If you punch someone in the face, that's a certain amount of energy. Uh, but if you explode a nuclear bomb, that's a lot more energy, of course. So there is a natural progression of the energies and the uh, power of these weapons. So in general, for example, we can say that uh, immobile systems will eventually progress to uh, like a field. And in the case of a steering wheel, a rigid steering wheel will progress to uh, electrical steering. If we look at the technology of a door, uh, a signal leaf, simple door will eventually progress to more of a light lock or energy-based door. So we can say the same for medicine. Medicine for thousands of years has been a matter on matter paradigm. A drug has to physically bind to a target protein or the hand or instrument or robot has to physically manipulate the target tissues in the case of medicine and surgery respectively. But the future in line with this natural evolution will be some form of energy on matter interaction. So another method of innovation is related to empathy. Uh, Satya Nadella, the Microsoft CEO said, empathy makes you a better innovator. Uh, what is empathy? Uh, it's very closely related to the Korean concept of nunchi to understand what other people are thinking. And if we can understand what other people are thinking and experiencing, then we can design products and services that are effectively implemented for those people. In other words, new products that become adopted by the market, which equals innovation. So how do we know what people are thinking and what they are doing? So we have what's called an empathy map. We outline what they're saying. We outline what they're doing we outline what they may be thinking, and very importantly, we outline what they may be feeling. So it's very important to map all these out to ultimately find out the needs and the insights of your user. So user-oriented uh, innovation. It relates to the early part of the lecture where basic research, when it's connected to applied research, becomes very powerful. A scientist sitting in their lab completely uh, unaware or uninterested in a user of their technology will not be an innovator. They will have a nice job, they get the salary. Uh, some people will say they are a smart uh, scientist, a smart professor, but they will not be innovators. They may imagine that they're innovators, they may tell other people that they're innovators, but it's all just a fantasy if they are not actually uh, making something that is going to be used by others. Uh, and so I'm not saying that all the scientists have to be empathetic, but if they want to have that kind of uh, impact, then this empathy approach is very important. A more powerful uh, extension of the empathy ap approach, which, and I think this is one of the best ways to innovate, is what's called design thinking. In design thinking, you have the empathy here, but in addition to empathizing, we're going to define the problem, make ideas about the problem. So that could be all the brainstorm we talked about, build a prototype, test the prototype, which relates to uh, interacting with the environment that we talked about and go into a cycle. Uh, you may go back to the beginning and so forth. As a result of the test, you get what the user wants. Another approach to uh, innovation is the business model canvas. And this is more for business model planning, but you know there can be business model innovation. So you wanna basically outline all the different elements. So this is a little bit like a concepts map, a little bit like a uh, uh, mind map, but applied to business. Another approach of innovation is crowdsourcing. So I posted this on the internet or on Facebook about solar panels. And in uh, Korea, in the solar panels in Korea, the US uh, Air Force pilots were complaining that they might be blinded by the reflection. And then I was thinking that if a solar panel is reflecting light, then that's not good because the purpose of a solar panel is to absorb light and convert it via photoelectric effect to, um, to electricity. 
So which means reflected light is inefficiency. So I decided to post something about that and I got 35 comments, a lot of people making some ideas and suggestions and it was very interesting to crowdsource this kind of uh, information. And again, related to this concept of differential fitness, testing what's out there. And finally, one of the students had mentioned about different industries. So I was at a conference at NASA, uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the one that goes to the space and all that. And this was a cross innovation forum that I was speaking at. And at this forum, uh, there was people from uh, cosmetics industry, from the tr uh, travel industry, from banks, from oil and gas and all the sorts of other industries, not just rocket scientists to come together, bring different ideas together. And uh, that was a very powerful way to innovate. So we will talk next week about rise and fall of civilizations and the role of innovation. So we'll go back into a little bit about innovation society uh, and how innovation affects society and some of the ethical aspects and the historical aspects and so forth building on the historical uh, discussion that we had earlier. So that's the end of the lecture. We had a lot of discussion and uh, I'm open to any questions.